there and welcome to Roundtable here on Talil Community Television. I'm your host, Adam Cook. On this week's show, we'll update you on a major fundraising campaign for a local hospital, a campaign that reached a major milestone far earlier than the fundraisers expected to. And you're also going to hear from a representative of the Two-Spirit LGBTQIA plus community about the two-year anniversary for Canada's ban on conversion therapy. But we begin with an update on the drive to save Pondville Beach and to see some infrastructure improvements and a new management plan coming into play. Nova Scotia's Department of Natural Resources and Renewables has released a new management plan. It came together on November the 29th. It's now available on the website for the DNRR. And a local group that has been fighting for several months to see improvements at Pondville Beach Provincial Park has been meeting over the past couple of days. They've been going over the 21-page document that I have here in my hands, and a representative of that committee is here right now. She is Lisa Boudreau. Thank you, Lisa, for joining me on Roundtable this week. Oh, thank you very much, Adam, for having me. So first of all, one of the biggest things we should make clear to our viewers right now, this is very much a plan that's still being developed. People have until January 31st to comment on it. There's been no timeline put together. There's been no official budget put together for this. So can you tell a little bit, first of all, about the idea that this is still a conversation that's very much still ongoing right now? Yes, I, I am. we see this uh, management plan as very fluid. It means that you know uh, people are able to and are encouraged to uh, put in their input, um, to read the plan, to understand the concepts and uh, to bring out points that they believe are very pertinent or things that they believe have been totally missed so that everyone's input has a loud voice going back to the Department of Natural Resources uh, with what's important for our beach here on Ilma Dam. And very soon we're going to let people know just how they can get involved and how they can make their voices heard and send their comments along. But first of all, as we're recording this interview, it's been less than 48 hours since you and other members of your committee, the Save Pondville Beach Provincial Park Committee, got together to talk about this plan and to plot out where to go from here. What's the initial reaction, both of yourself and your fellow committee members and others that are concerned about Pondville Beach? What did you folks think of this document? Well, based on the um, meeting that was held in June, uh, it was very well attended and a lot of people have been very patiently waiting for this document. The Department of Natural Resources and Renewables indicated that the document would be available by December. So I believe it was December 31st that the document actually came um, was provided to us through email. Uh, so the members of the committee that, and uh, those who provided emails would have gotten it directly. And then our job was to sit down and look at that and then start to process it out to the public so that they can in fact put their input in. So we're very, very happy to have the management plan um, as a document that we can review. It's brought out some very pertinent points, some really interesting facts and uh, and it outlines exactly what the infrastructure will look like, uh, what, uh, what parts of the, of the beach are actually part of the park itself. Um, it's not the whole beach, it's a very small park actually. And it's identified and classified as a wayside park, which means that it's in the middle of a community, that it's along the roadway, that it's accessible to a lot of people in different ways. They acknowledge that, um, that people would likely bike there, walk there, drive there, that some may uh, use small craft. And, um, and so it's an interesting document. And, and it also pulls out some very important points about protection and um, I guess keeping the beach intact, allowing it to rejuvenate. Um, and all of the other aspects of the beach that are, that are protected under the um, Beaches Act. All right, well, let's look at a couple of major points that have come through in this proposed management plan. You talk about the idea of the beach rejuvenating, and one major move that's planned here that's done with the rejuvenation of the beach in mind is the removal of infrastructure such as the change houses and the public washrooms 
those things would be relocated to the intersection of Gibbs Lane with North Ponville Road heading towards the beach with gated access to the beach from there. That isn't really clearly defined in this document. What did you and your committee think about the idea of this relocation? Um, well, after reviewing the document and understanding what the processes are that are involved in uh, protecting a beach, so primarily the Department of Natural Resources and Renewables has a mandate for protecting properties. This is a protected area under their jurisdiction. So they have identified some of the impacts to the beach over time, things that have changed, things that were culturally maybe acceptable at one time or accepted for natural processes that no longer fit that area right now. Um, we have tidal surges, we have rising tides, uh, we have wind patterns that are different. Um, we have impacts caused by nature and impacts, human impacts to that area. Uh, what we're seeing is tidal surges that actually um, allow water to flow from one side of the parking lot to the other, mm -hmm. and that causes immense erosion to all the infrastructure in that region, including the wharf and the bridge and the road to the, to the park. So I think uh, what they're trying to say and what they've listed in the document is that the dunes that would normally shift, because they do, are being impacted by the fact that the parking lot is behind the dune. And the fact that the dune is not able to shift means that the water that, that, that surges up during high tides or storms uh, is actually not able to be absorbed by the dune and, and actually rushes through. So that point is actually in great peril of, uh, of losing infrastructure to a point where it might not be usable at all. So we, we accept that the Department of Natural Resources and Renewables has a mandate and that that is not something that's going to be within the control of this particular uh, aspect of it in this document. Certainly people can express their position on that and I'm sure they will take that into consideration when they look at the, at the proposed placement of the parking lot. Um, the parking lot itself has the closest uh, parking for accessible, accessibility needs only, so I would say wheelchair parking, that kind of thing. Um, the, uh, the new uh, change rooms and uh, washrooms uh, would be accessible as well and placed in an area that would be of closest to that particular parking area and to the walkway. The barriers, um, it's, they have not given a lot of detail as to some of the infrastructure, so it's hard to say what the barriers will look like, if they're going to be permanent, or if they will allow to have a swinging arm based on the need. So if you have the need to get some you know, emergency vehicles at least to the, to the bridge, that that would be possible. Um, I think there's a lot of variables for discussion here as to how that might be. Uh, will they have a defibrillator somewhere nearby in case someone is, uh, be, you know, has um, that sort of, of need or emergency? Uh, that those defibrillators are being seen much more commonly in uh, parks and areas where people gather. So uh, that's something to be considered as well. There's a lot of variables there and things that need to be discussed and that's why the public's input is so important to make sure that what the resulting management plan looks like is something that people can understand and can feel that their viewpoints have been taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as we're talking about this, just before we started recording, you and I were talking that accessibility issues aren't clearly defined in this document, in yes. this proposed management plan. Uh, obviously, this is one of a number of areas to be further developed by DNRR and in conjunction with people like your committee. But by the same token, I know that accessibility has been a big issue for a lot of you. Uh, some of you have referred to the developments that took place at Inverness Provincial Beach just a couple of summers ago and have been looked at as well for Point Michaud Beach, although that is a different kind of beach than Pondville Provincial Park. Uh, that being said, uh, are you hopeful that the upcoming discussion, the discussion with the deadline of January 31st, will allow for more 
solid ideas in terms of accessibility and give the department some direction in this regard? Absolutely, absolutely. From the very start and foremost, the most important part of this uh, beach project was to provide a protection of the beach to make sure because it seemed to be falling into such uh, a dis derelict uh, sort of state that we needed to speak up for him for the beach. The second part or the most important part to me would be accessibility. So the document lays out a need for accessibility but the language does not follow that throughout the document. Accessibility should be made foremost in every aspect of this document, in every part of the infrastructure, and in every um, any further development that would be added to the, to the document. So this is a 10-year working plan, mm -hmm. which means that in 10 years they review it. We should have at least reached accessibility foremost throughout this entire plan. Um, we talk about beach protection and the fact that dunes are shifting, that that is a primary focus for the Department of Natural Resources. But the walkway, it's not identified as to whether it's a raised walkway to allow those processes to occur, which is what you see normally in every park, or if somehow they're going to sweep the sand away and cut through the dune, which, which negates any of the... Um, positive benefits to providing those natural processes to occur. Um, we had hoped in the initial request that part of the wharf that was not immediately impacted at this time would be maybe made accessible and used for a viewing platform, um, maybe fishing, maybe um, yoga or soft touch painting classes, whatever. Um, and that the rest of it maybe might be protected and covered. So I think the document talks about armor stone, yes. sort of a jetty kind of a look for that area. It's still unidentified as to whether or not the foremost entry to that area would be available. Um, and in lieu of that, if it's not, then it's, it's very common that walkways to the beach include a bump out of sorts that a sort of a landing platform with a bench for see people who may need to sit at that point that would not be able to manipulate stairs or walk a soft, soft surface, or an area where someone could uh, sit with a wheelchair, um, you know, young children in a, in a stroller, anything at all that would, require, that would enable someone with uh, accessibility needs to be able to sit there and enjoy the natural view, the sights, the sounds of the beach itself. You brought up the wharf facility being capped with armor stone in this proposed document and obviously we've known that wharf has been deteriorating for several years. What did you and your committee think of the idea that this is the proposed fix for that wharf at least temporarily? We were a little surprised. I think comments was made that they didn't think jetties were the, being used at this time. Um, I fully expected to have wave impact barriers of some kind and then some sort of capping for the wharf itself. Um, it, could be, it could be just down to dollars and cents. I don't know. I think Armour Stone is very expensive and I think the placement of that would not be a cheap uh, alternative either. Um, but I'm assuming that that that's, was the quickest maybe and easiest fix for them. Uh, so we're willing to accept whatever they come with because um, the, it's very important that the wharf itself as an infrastructure piece remains because it allows the, the, a bit of a barrier for the sand that would continue to block that particular channel. And if it does, then we have rising uh, water levels on the other side, which would impact you know, the road, the houses, and the beach itself when it finally breaks through. Mm -hmm. It needs to flow out somewhere. Yeah. 
Now, earlier in our conversation, Lisa, you referred to the public engagement session that was held at the Rocky Bay Irish Hall back in June of 2023. Several members of DNRR from across Cape Breton and across the province were in attendance as well as the MLA. Do you feel that what the public got out at the, that engagement session is reflected in this 21 page document? Do you folks feel like you're being heard at this point? I believe so, yes. I was very, very, very happy with the outcome of that particular meeting. Happy with the uh, level of community engagement. I believe there were over 80 people in attendance. You're talking, you know, summer on a really nice evening, so that was really nice to see. It was also so very well attended by the Department of Natural Resources themselves. There were had at least eight staff there and the MLA, our two councillors were there. So it was really nice to see that engagement. I really, really liked the way that the meeting was, um, was uh, planned and executed. Mm -hmm. The round tables are always nice. Yes. They ensured that one of their staff sat at each table or went around and, and made sure people, you know, if they had questions, it could be answered. They asked for that table's input. So they got a segment, at least eight different uh, viewpoints from people who sat around a table that did not necessarily speak to those at the other tables. So sort of unique viewpoints for the tables. There were some common themes there, but there were some real outliers that were very interesting to uh, to listen to. They gathered all that information and they brought it back and put it into a document. Was Were all of those ideas put into the document? Maybe not at this point. Maybe some of them need to be re-itinerated and emphasized a bit more so that the document actually evolves into what that meeting portrayed. Or maybe there are new considerations based on what is in the document that we never thought of at all that need to be addressed or, yeah, this is really, really good. I'm glad you have that in there. This, though, I wish was there. This is really important to me, right? That sort of thing. So I think accessibility is not overly played here. And because we assume that the province would ensure accessibility. We may overlook the fact that it's not there, but I think the language, it's very important that the language is throughout the document mm -hmm. in every paragraph on every point so that we're sure that we've got it in there. Yeah. So now the process begins towards making this document into something permanent and that's something that local people can participate in. We're going to be putting up on our screen the address for the Department of Natural Resources and Renewables representative that will be taking written comments. There's also an email address that people can get their comments to. So basically, what are you saying to the general community right now in terms of making their voices heard and building up what we've seen here? Well, first of all, read the document. It's so important to read the document. Um, we, as a committee, have, have opened the Facebook page, Save Palmville Peace Provincial Park, and uh, we've had a lot of engagement on that page. A lot of people shared stories and things like that. So very recently, we put up a chat so that people could actually view the document. The document is online as well. View the document and then talk about how they feel about certain aspects of it. We recently, or last yesterday when we met, we took those points um, put them into a spreadsheet under headings and people can now use it as a Google Docs to add more uh, comments under certain headings. So there's infrastructure, there's, um, you know, there's the bridge, the wharf, there's the change rooms and the, uh, the uh, toilets, there's the parking lot, there's rules around ATVs and dogs, there's, uh, you know, general ha about the document itself. So they can just put their ideas where it falls and then that can help others to say, yeah, I agree or I don't agree and use, just snip it, what they like and put it in their letter to the Department of Natural Resources. So that is the key. We do not get anything if no one mentions that they, it's important to them. 
The squeaky wheel gets the grease, and the more letters we have sent or emails to the Department of Natural Resources about this document, the more money will be put into the project when the time comes. And that's the most important thing. For me, personally, the most important things to me are accessibility, as I said, education on a lot of different aspects, however that portrays to the beach, and intergenerational opportunities, which means that it's good for kids, it's good for families, it's good for seniors, it's good for people who are able-bodied, and it's good for people who need some accessibility. Um, and then everyone gets to enjoy it. Did you have anything else you wanted to add here just before we wrap up? Well, first of all, it was very, made very clear at the meeting just how important, and I'm talking the meeting in June, yes. how important this beach was to the local people. And when we put the Facebook page up, how many people from away who had even just been to El Madam for a day and who went to the beach? You know, important for, for tourism, important for economic development, important for locals. And very recently, the Department of Natural Resources has, has adapted the importance of natural spots for, um, for uh, mental health and well-being in general. So I think that those types of things need to be really pushed out there to the Department of Natural Resources so that we can make this beach the best beach for us here and for others who come to use it as well. Well, we look forward to seeing what the public engagement is like at this stage of this conversation as we head towards the January 31st deadline to get comments in on the new proposed management document. But in the meantime, Lisa Boudreau, we appreciate your viewpoint and that of the Save Pondville Beach Provincial Park Committee. Thank you so much for coming to Tell Hill and joining me today on Roundtable. Well, thank you so much, Adam. It's always a pleasure. All right. <laughs> Lisa Boudreau is a spokesperson for the Save Pondville Beach Provincial Park Committee. We've been speaking to her here at our Telil Studios. We're going to shift gears now over to healthcare, and obviously one of the major things that are required at any healthcare facility in our area is equipment that will serve for various medical purposes. And a major equipment fundraising drive has been taking place over the past 10 years over at St. Martha's Regional Hospital in Antigonish, a facility that's no stranger to many of our Tailil viewers. Well, as you're about to hear, that fundraising campaign, St. Martha's and You, The Time Is Now, recently reached a major milestone. Here to talk about it is the chair of the St. Martha's Regional Hospital Foundation, Megan McGilvery Case. Can you tell me a little about where exactly you are right now and what that means for the hospital foundation and for the hospital as a whole? For sure. Um, so in 2016, our found foundation started their uh, St. Martha's and You, The Time Is Now campaign. Uh, the goal of that campaign was to raise our endowment fund from $3.5 million to $20 million. And we had set out to do that by 2026, and I'm happy to say that we have reached that milestone and reached it early. Now, can I ask you something? You're chair of the foundation. What did it feel like for you and for your colleagues to look at the figures and look at each other and say, basically, we're three years early? You know, what kind of feeling is that for you? Uh, it, it's really amazing. Um, but I think that everyone who has had a part of the campaign uh, needs to give themselves a pat on the back um, and every single donor uh, it just it's incredible work and i think speaks to the incredible generosity of uh, of our communities now i remember back in 2016 steve smith who was at the time heading up this campaign was coming to municipal council meetings in different parts of Northeastern Nova Scotia, Cape Breton Island, and warning of a healthcare tsunami coming in the 2020s. The aging population of not only Nova Scotia, but especially in our region, was going to warrant increased and aggressive spending on healthcare and especially on equipment needed for hospitals. Can you tell me, do you remember hearing about those times? You know, has that been something that you and your foundation have been driving home? And do you think the message has gotten through? One would suggest that it has. 
I, I, I think it's 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 clear. I'm not involved in healthcare as a professional, but certainly as a user and as a, as as chair of the foundation. Um, certainly, we've been hearing um, that there is a great deal of need uh, out there uh, to support our hospitals, uh, to support our healthcare professionals. Um, and I think any user of the system is is aware that our healthcare workers uh, certainly are working. Uh, so hard to serve uh, so many patients. Um, and and uh, the foundation does what it can. You know, our mandate is to support enhanced equipment, uh, education and training opportunities uh, at our local hospital. I want to get a sense from you on how important an endowment like this is based on the funding that hospitals receive from the provincial government, from Department of Health and Wellness. So can you give us a little bit of how necessary not only an endowment is and fundraising is, but this specific campaign was for St. Martha's Regional Hospital? Uh, certainly. Um, the stats that we have are that on average, Nova Scotia Health uh, receives, uh, you know, somewhere, uh, and I, I don't know the exact figure, but somewhere, say, between 10 and $15 million for equipment for local hospitals. As it stands today, there's there's over $200 million worth of uh, equipment required to support our hospitals. And that's not just, just at St. Martha's, that's across the province. Um, but uh, more and more foundations are, are being asked to, to fund equipment, uh, to, to partner with Nova Scotia Health to make sure that our hospitals have current uh, and up-to-date equipment. So let's look at various individual purchases, even just a couple of examples, if we could, uh, of things that St. Martha's Hospital has been able to do as a result of this fundraising campaign and will be able to do in the future. What can you tell us about essentially where the money is going? Sure thing. So um, I can tell you that in 2022, 2023, um, our foundation has committed over $900,000 to our local hospital. Um, so that's to purchase uh, enhanced equipment um, and, and education and research opportunities. Um, some, of, some of the things that we've purchased or committed to, uh, to, to, uh, to fund um, recently are um, microscope. Uh, we have scoliosis imaging, uh, um, imaging for the OR. Um, we've supported our dietary uh, um, unit. Um, with special refrigeration. Um, uh, we, we've uh, committed money to buy a myoshore system, uh, ophthalmology equipment, um, some chest compression systems, a bladder scanner. Those are just, you know, recent uh, commitments that we've made. All right. Now, let's make it clear to our viewers here at Telel Community Television as well, too, just because you folks have reached your fundraising total for this specific campaign, that doesn't mean that fundraising stopped or that you as chair of the St. Martha's Hospital Foundation are suddenly out of a job. There's still more work to be done. Where do we go from here then, Megan McGilvery case, in terms of what happens now in terms of fundraising? So, I, you know, we're so pleased that we've we've reached this milestone, but you're correct. This is just a milestone. We haven't completed our fundraising. Uh, the need continues uh, for St. Martha's. Um, and and, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we're we're prepared to meet the needs of our patients in this community now uh, and for generations to come. Um, so certainly we're still accepting donations. Uh, multi-year pledges. Uh, we welcome everyone's support. Uh, we have an annual golf tournament, uh, hospital help day. There's there's many ways to, to help out the foundation. But like I said, this is a, our, our plan and our mandate is to ensure that the patients of St. Martha's uh, have quality uh, health care, the, the quality health care that, that they're used to, that they've counted on for years, uh, that that continues for generations to come. At this point, I'd like to give you the opportunity to give thanks to those who have contributed because it's come from everybody from individual donors to municipal units, to businesses, corporate donations. So this basically is your opportunity to thank those. And I just wonder who do you look to in terms of thanking the public for helping St. Martha's Hospital Foundation reach this milestone? Oh my goodness. Well, I, you know, I, I certainly uh, like to thank 
everyone uh, who was involved with the Time Is Now campaign. Um, Steve Smith, as you mentioned, was chair, uh, but everyone involved for their very, very hard work. Um, we've had over 1,900 uh, individuals and businesses contribute to the campaign to date. I can't name every single one of them, but I would like no. each and every person who has contributed to this campaign uh, in any way uh, to know that, that we thank you from the bottoms of our hearts. Uh, I do uh, the foundation and I'm sure healthcare professionals as well. Um, and, and I would be remiss without recognizing our physicians, nurses and staff at St. Martha's. Um, they continue to, to give quality care. Um, and it's, it's, it's really my pleasure uh, to, to, uh, to be able to, to do what I can uh, to help healthcare in this community. But uh, yeah, I, many, many thanks to those over 1,900 people who have contributed to this campaign. It's pretty amazing. And as we're winding down here, Megan, uh, this might seem like an unusual question, but I want to put it out to you. There are, of course, others involved in healthcare in our region that do their own fundraising. Uh, locally in Evanston, the Straight Richmond Hospital Foundation has been doing their own gift appeal for many years. They just finished that up over the Christmas period. What do you say to smaller groups or even groups roughly the same size as yours that are heading out on an ambitious 10-year or multi-year fundraising campaign to ensure that equipment comes to hospitals, to ensure that health care is of a high quality in our region? Basically, what do you say to others who are in the same position as you folks were in only a couple of years ago? I'd say don't underestimate the generosity of your community. Um, I think uh, we, we just live in such a special place. Um, you know, our, 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 the citizens of our community, are, they're just, they, 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 we are a generous uh, group of people. Uh, don't underestimate um, the generosity and, and take the help. If anybody offers to help you with a campaign, obviously uh, uh, take the help. Um, call us too if 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 there's smaller foundations that want to know uh, how we did this. Um, we're happy to share. Uh, it's a good news story, and we're happy to help. Well, Megan McGilvery Case, it's not often that I, as a journalist, have wound up interviewing somebody at the successful end of a campaign, as opposed to at the very start of a campaign when they're trying to get noticed. So we want to congratulate you and your colleagues at St. Martha's on behalf of us here at Telil Community Television. And thank you for giving me some time here to talk about this milestone and where St. Martha's goes from here. Thanks so much. Thank you. Megan McGilvery Case is the chair of the St. Martha's Regional Hospital Foundation. We've been speaking to her today from her office in Antigonish via Zoom. Stay tuned for more of Roundtable in just a moment. We have just passed the two-year anniversary of a federal ban on conversion therapy in Canada. However, Canada is one of only 12 countries around the world in which this practice is illegal. To get her thoughts on that and also to get some perspective on exactly what conversion therapy is, I've spoken to Veronica Merrifield. She is the founder and head of the Cape Breton Transgender Network and also the past president of an online resource called Conversion Therapy Survivors Connect. Here is my conversation with Veronica Merrifield right now. And now joining us to discuss the two-year anniversary of Canada's official ban on conversion therapy, we are pleased to welcome back to Telil Community Television, the head of the Cape Breton Transgender Network, Veronica Merrifield, speaking to us from Sydney. Veronica, thank you for joining me here today. Thank you for having me. So we wanted to speak about a significant milestone for the LGBTQIA and Two-Spirit community, that being Canada's ban on conversion therapy. It was originally discussed just before the federal election of 2021, it didn't have the full support of the House at that point, but following the election, it did get enough support to be able to be brought into law. That happened on January the 7th, 2022, just two years ago. So can you tell me a little bit, first of all, about the actual definition of conversion therapy? I think some of our viewers might know it, but others may not. How would you describe conversion therapy? Sure. So I'm going to call, I'm going to use the phrase conversion practices um, and conversion practices include any practice, treatment or service 
that is based on the assumption that being heterosexual is the only normal way to express sexuality and that a person's gender identity necessarily matches their assigned sex at birth. Now, I want to ask you, in your personal life experiences, when did you first hear about conversion therapy and what was your immediate reaction <laughs> to the concept of, as you described them, conversion practices? What so was your response? So I didn't actually come across the terminology in this way until around 2018, I, I think. Um, somewhere around where where it was being discussed at federal level for the first time. Um, and it didn't really strike me as hard as it did a few years later when I realized um, that I'd been through that and not necessarily understood what was being done to me at the time. So um, then it became much more poignant um, and an understanding of the damage that is done and was done. Is there anything you can tell our viewers about what you personally experienced? And if this goes too far, we, we do understand and we can move on. But is there anything you can tell us about your own experience having had this done to you? I'm going to talk to you about the experience of somebody who was at the same, um, was experiencing the same thing as I was at the hands of a religious group in the UK at the time so this was quite some years ago um and they ended up taking their life uh, a couple of weeks after i managed to get out of the situation now i understood the situation wasn't doing me any good but i didn't understand quite how destructive it was um until later um but the loss of my friend um hit me hard then and it still hits pretty hard because that's quite a common outcome. Um, and in the thinking about what happened to me as I was um, thinking about the proposed van, it struck me how much my upbringing had been um, a part of this process too, about the assumptions about heterosexuality and gender norm, um, um, and how much damage that had been done to me. Um, Again, not from a religious perspective, where um, you know the statements in absolutes of how bad somebody is, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, without sharing a lot of detail, I think that's probably a fairly concise thing from me. Has that guided you in terms of your own personal involvement with seeing? conversion practices banned not only in Nova Scotia, but also across the country. Uh, you've made it a point to be involved here to share what you've learned and what you've learned personally. Does that guide you day by day as you look back on this two-year anniversary federally and also a, an anniversary that uh, now is going on five and a half years in Nova Scotia, just basically do your past experiences and the experiences of your friend guide you in terms of trying to make sure these practices don't happen anymore? Yes, very much so. Um, so I I think for a lot of the advocacy stuff, um, efforts that I do, it's um, formed largely on my own experiences um, and taking those um, difficult experiences um, and working to make sure that people don't have to go through them anymore. Um, uh, and that's a whole other topic. Um, but yes, uh, guiding Nova Scotians, Canadians and people in the world. So I I have ended up being drawn into um, some of the efforts outside of Canada to ban conversion practices. Can you tell me what other countries you've been involved in in these discussions? Because I know that conversion practices are banned in 12 countries around the world, including Canada as of two years ago, but what other countries have you been sharing your experience and your expertise with in this regard? Mostly the UK and the US is where I'm being drawn into. Um, the, uh, the UK experience is obviously the one that I had, um, and I've seen that the UK government have been um, discussing conversion therapy bans um, and 
um, not encouraged. I'm not encouraged by their stance on that. In that they are looking to ban it for um, sexuality reasons, but not for gender reasons. Is that discouraging, especially when you compare it to the experiences you've had here in Nova Scotia and in Canada in terms of being able to present this information? Uh, do you it's, find that basically you had it easier in this country than you've had in other countries, including your country of origin? It's nice to be in a country that um, understands the difficulties and damage that conversion practices um, bring forward. Um, the the issue in the UK, I think, is wrapped around um, a whole pile of other issues to do with um, gender identity recognition uh, that have been ongoing for years. And certainly um, lots of work that was being done on that before I left the UK. Um, but it is poignant because I've you know, still got communities that I know back there who are suffering from this. Um, and I mentioned earlier that, um, you know, that we should in theory, is stopping the actions of conversion practices. But my concern is that conversion practices are being relabeled or renamed and being executed in various places still. Um, so, you know, part of the work I did last year as the past uh, chair of Conversion Therapy Survivors Connect was to get a, help get an organization up to support. Um, those that have been going through conversion therapy. And although that was essentially a Canadian based um, organization, we were seeing people coming in from um, outside of Canada. But I've also been helping some folks at stopconversionpractices.ca who are just launching their new website. Um, um, and it's nice to see that they've got a lot of this material on there. Um, but they also understand that some of these practices are still happening. Um, they're just called something different and they're being executed in a more subtle way, which is one of the problems with a lot of conversion practices is those that are um, being sub subjected to it um, don't know what they're being subjected to. And by the time they do, it's often too late. Now, I want to pick up on the point you made about the resource Conversion Therapy Survivors Connect, an online resource, and you were a past chair for this particular organization. And I'd like to talk to you a bit about the importance of having these resources for survivors of conversion practices, because it's often important to recall that it's one thing to say that suicide is a common end to conversion practices, but that those who don't take their own lives and move on don't always find the moving on to be so easy after going through a traumatic experience. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of taking someone who's been through conversion practices and guiding them on to reclaiming their lives? Yes, so you're right that there's a, um, those of us who have managed to move on are often left with um, deep psychological scars over our validity of our identity, shall we say. Um, and it's proven to be a, a um, hard topic for uh, professionals in a support capacity or in a um, therapeutic capacity to be able to help with. Because a lot of the um, techniques that they would use uh, rely on you having some sort of validity um, whereas conversion practices really do take away your core identity um, and leave you with nothing uh, other than feeling bad for who you are. Um, so the, the support groups are one place where often um, stigmatized and uh, individuals who feel very much alone have somebody else or other people that they can share that with um, knowing that they don't have to explain why they feel the way they do and how they feel because we all get it. Um, and we get, to sh we get to share things that have proven useful for us individually um, and different things work for everybody differently. Um, and it does take time. It takes a lot of time. Um, but the positive news is it does work. So the power of support groups is where it is. Um, 
and I'm pleased that um, more people are reaching out, which is the other piece that happens um, when you feel that alone and you feel that invalidated, you really have a hard time reaching out um, and knowing there's a safe space to go to speak with others either virtually or um, uh, in person is useful. Um, and there are some in-person gatherings starting to happen in Cape Breton. Um, and I'm hoping that that's going to be a pattern that, that we see across Canada. I know there are uh, in-person groups in isolated locations around Canada, but um, the more of those that we can get, that there are, the better it is for everybody that's been through it. We'll hope for the best there. And in the meantime, as we're winding down here, where do we go from here on this topic, Veronica Merrifield? I mean, we have reached the two-year anniversary of conversion practices ban in Canada. You mentioned you're still talking to people in different countries, the UK, the US. A dozen countries for a conversion practices ban is a step forward, but it's still only a dozen countries for the whole world. What are your thoughts as we look into 2024 and beyond in terms of being able to discuss this issue? Well, I mean, there's a couple of points there. We are discussing the issue, so it is getting the air um, airtime that it needs so people understand this. This is a, a piece around education, particularly for you know, those who are in health healthcare, healthcare practitioners, you know, those in faith organizations, those in other 2SLGBTQIA plus um, service provisioning. Um, uh, community members, teachers, um, and so on. Um, but for those who um, need to find support, um, having that message out there means that they're starting to find that support. And I'm hoping that, uh, I think two years ago when, when the ban went through in Canada, there were five countries who had conversion therapy bans. So five to 12 in two years is, um, is good news. Um, I'm hoping that that will... Uh, accelerate um, so that there's a broader understanding of the damage that this does and to stop it. But as I said, in close to the opening, it's still happening behind closed doors in certain places. Well, we appreciate you sharing your thoughts and parts of your personal story on this, uh, a very difficult issue, but we appreciate you taking some time to talk to us about it. We've covered a lot of ground in a short time. Veronica, did you want to add anything else about this just before we wrap up? I want to thank you for this time and opportunity to um, talk about this. It's an important topic and to commemorate two years. Um, there were times prior to it going through that I didn't think it was going to happen. Um, and it's the issue that brought me um, way out in public to um, campaign for this. Um, so I'm, I was pleased with that, but you know, two years is still better than it's waiting for it to go through. So this is good news. Well, we're glad to be able to speak to you on this and we appreciate you giving us some time here. Thank you, Veronica Merrifield, for yeah. joining us once again on Talil Community Television. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Talil. Talil Community Television is pleased to share with you the viewpoint of Veronica Merrifield, who is the head of the Cape Breton Transgender Network and the past president of Conversion Therapy Survivors Connect. We've been speaking to her in Sydney via Zoom. And there you have it. That wraps up this week's edition of Roundtable here on Talil Community Television. Thank you for tuning in, and a special thank you to my interview guests this week, Lisa Boudreau, Megan McGilvery-Case, and Veronica Merrifield. If you have any thoughts about what you've seen on Roundtable this week, or you'd just like to make suggestions for a future edition of the show, I'd love to hear them. You can contact me directly. My phone number is 902-625-8863, and you can reach me by email using the address adamjrcook, cook with an e, at gmail.com. You can also contact Talil Community Television directly with your ideas and your comments. The station phone number here in Arishat is 902-226-1928, and the best email address to use is talil at talil.tv. As always, you can follow Talil on social media. We're on X, formerly known as Twitter, and we're also on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. And our Talil YouTube channel features every single episode of Roundtable, including this one. And we also offer the same service for our sister program, Talil 24-7. 
And you can check out all kinds of brand new French language journalism that's being produced by the newest member of the Telil news team, Jacqueline Girouard. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thank you once again for joining me for this week's edition of Roundtable. I look forward to seeing you again next week with a brand new show. Bye for now.